and 7, beginning at verse 1, I just want to exhort us tonight, if you've ever been in the company of someone who has a hearing problem, i.e. if you've ever spent much time around me, then you've probably heard the phrase rather frequently, speak up, I can't hear you. But tonight I'm going to put a twist on that phrase, and I'm going to say instead of speak up, I can't hear you, I'm going to say it this way. Speak up, you can't hear you. All right, little twist. All right, simple word of exhortation. Psalm 107, beginning of verse 1 through verse 3. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. I'm just going to read those three verses. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. But tonight I want to talk to us. Speak up, you can't hear you. Master, we thank you, God, for your word this evening. Lord, if you would condescend at this moment, God, to anoint us and help us, to deliver this simple word of exhortation that you've placed on my heart, God, that the people of God might be encouraged, that those in this room might be lifted up, those that would hear by tape, those that would hear on the Internet, God, that they too might be strengthened and, and encouraged by that which we're about to say. For God, I believe there's an important lesson for every child of God to be learned in this message. God, anoint our lips of clay today, for outside of your anointing, there's nothing that I can say that would be of value or help or assistance to the people of God. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated tonight. You know, it's so funny. We live in a time when television, Christianity, is constantly trying to tell us that as the people of God, we need to stand up and make ourselves heard. We need to stand up and, uh, and take account of ourselves and let the world know that we're here. And oftentimes they'll use this verse from Psalm 107 in verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And they'll use that phrase as the battle cry for standing up and sounding off and making yourself heard to the world. But you see, my friend, the reality today is this. God does not speak in His Word that the redeemed of the Lord ought to speak so that the world can hear them. God has spoken to the church this hour. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so so that we can hear ourselves say what we are saying so that we can become convinced in ourselves that we are the redeemed of the Lord. Hallelujah. Sometimes there are, uh, there are times that I have a bad habit. I've told Tommy a I don't know how many times. If I don't say something out loud, I'll forget it. Sure as I'm alive, if I don't say it, I'll forget it. So sometimes if I have an errand or a chore that I need to do, I have a habit of saying to myself, well, let's see now, I've got to pay that bill, I need to go do this, and I've got to run by the bank. You know, anybody who might, you know, be a fly on the wall watching me would think I was out of my mind, lunatic, crazy, talking to myself. But sometimes in order to keep my thoughts organized and straightened out, in order to remain uh, well aware of what I'm trying to do, I've got to speak it. It's not enough to merely think the thought. There are many people today who are trying to serve the Lord. There are many people today who are trying to be Christians. There are many people today baptized in Jesus' name. Uh, some have got the Holy Ghost, some don't. But the problem is the enemy comes against their life and things happen. And after a while, uh, you know, the reality that they are the redeemed of the Lord. They are the purchased possession of God Almighty by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Sometimes that reality is in their mind, but it becomes more and more and more suppressed until eventually it's forgotten. And the Word of God today is not admonishing the church that we're to make a nuisance of ourselves and we're to get politically involved and we're to get 
uh, socially involved. No, that is not what the word of the Lord is saying when it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It is saying, children, remind yourself of who you are. Remind yourself of who you are. Hallelujah. Remind yourself every once in a while. Stand upon your feet and declare, Oh, I'm a child of God. I've been purchased by the blood of Calvary. And devil, you have no claims on me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's not about making a nuisance of yourself in the world. It's about making a nuisance of yourself in the bowels of hell and making the devil quake and tremble. The Bible said we're made overcomers by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb won't do it alone, Mother. Sometimes you've got to open your mouth and say something. Hallelujah. If you want to defeat the devil on his own territory, he's constantly talking to you. So sometimes you've got to talk back. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Speak up. You can't hear you. Come on, children, talk so you can hear yourself. Let the devil know who you are. Let him know, devil, I'm going through, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. One day, devil, this church is going to be the greatest, most powerful force in the city of Dallas, and there's not a thing you can do about it. Hallelujah. Amen. You want to see it happen? Start saying it. Amen. Bible talks about professing a positive profession. When the spies came back from the land of Canaan, Joshua and Caleb were the only two out of the twelve that came back and said, Yes, we can do it. Yes, like we sing in the chorus, we are able to go up and take this country, to possess the land from Jordan to the sea. Though the giants will be there our way to hinder, I know our God will give the victory. God wouldn't have brought us here if he didn't expect for us to be able to win this battle. God wouldn't have led us to Canaan if he didn't anticipate standing behind us and supporting us so that we could reclaim the land. Amen. A positive profession means simply speak it like you believe it. Say it. You know, if there's anything that can be destructive in a person, in a human being, in a child's life, in a relationship, in a marriage, it's words. Stuff comes out of your mouth can tear things up or it can build things up. But you know what? Try to tell people. Try to tell a husband. Try to tell a wife. The greatest responsibility you have to your partner is to build them up. Try to tell people that. And you know what? They, they'll sit there and look at you like you've just asked them to drink a cup full of blended worms. Oh, God, it's so hard. Oh, what in the world are you talking about? Oh, that's too much work. Like, oh, I want the benefits of marriage. I want to be able to come home to my wife, and I want my wife and her little dainties, and I want her looking pretty for me, and I want her ready for, you know, a little bit of the mattress tango. I want the benefits of marriage, but I don't want to pay the price for the relationship. I don't want to pay the price for, for that for that uh, union. But you see, the greatest responsibility, and there's a reason why this is the greatest responsibility in marriage, because children, listen to me today. Almost anywhere you go in the world, your job, get stopped by a cop and see if a cop sings your praises. But bless God, you know, you're about the best driver I've ever seen. You know, I don't believe I've ever seen anybody drive as good as you do. No. Everything in our society is based on responding to and reacting to the negative. Am I right? Everything. Watch a child. Look at little baby Gavin. He'll walk along and do a thousand little cute things and we'll go, Oh, cute, 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 cute. Let that kid reach for one of Grandma's crystal... Uh, votives or one of her look at, and all of a sudden it's going to be, don't touch that, don't go near that. 
Isn't it funny? We don't scream and holler the way we do when they do something cute, like we do when they do something that's potentially damaging or hurtful, harmful. See, that's the way human beings are designed. We're reactionary. We're not creatures of action. We're creatures of reaction. But you see, if you're going to be in a relationship, I don't just mean lovers, partners, husbands, wives. I'm talking about if you're going to be a parent. I think this is the biggest problem we have in our society today. People become parents. And here's the truth that they do not understand. Your first obligation to that child is to build them up. Everything that child faces in their life, every day of their life, every day they get on that school bus and go to school, there are going to be thousands of things that are coming at them trying to tear them down. Am I telling the truth today? And it is your job as a parent to build them up. If nobody else in the world believes in them, you should believe in them. If nobody else in the world thinks they can, you should say they can. If nobody in, else in the world thinks they should try, you should say, go on, baby, give it a try. You can't know what it is to succeed unless you try. And if you fail this time, that's okay. Then you can try harder the next time. But you see, we've raised a society of uh, psychological cripples. Because everything in our society is uh, aimed to come at people from a very negative vantage point. Say, well, brother, not everything's negative. Look at the advertising that we have. Why, if you want to sell a speedboat made by the Booger Brothers, then they have all these beautiful women in, uh, in their bikinis, and they're all, you know, woo -hoo. You know, and you've got all these beautiful women selling everything. In the, well, that's not a negative message. Sure, it isn't a negative message if you look like the beautiful woman in the bikini. Yeah, right. Well, what's the message being sent to the poor little fat kid down on the corner of the street? That poor little girl who can't get a date to go to the prom. That poor little girl who can't get a little boy to act like he likes her and that he's interested in her. What does that message send to her? She ain't nothing but worthless to society. Why? Because she don't look right. Do you see what I'm trying to tell you today? Everything around us is designed to destroy us. Literally. Everything around us is designed to tear us down. You say, Brother Marl, that's a horrible thing to say. Why, that's absurd. Why would you suggest such a thing? My friend, look at the law of nature. Everything around you, the elements. Why do we build houses to protect ourselves from the elements? Because if we don't, they'll kill us. If the heat don't get you, the cold will. If the sun don't get you, the cold, you know what I'm saying? Uh, every single thing around us, it, that is part of the human condition. Everything around you is designed to destroy you, and that is why we have this little thing that we call survival. You know, we, we, we strive to survive, and we have to have housing and shelter. We have to have water and food. We have to work ourselves to the bone in order to have all these things because life is a very destructive, negative kind of an energy that just flows endlessly. Take a big, beautiful yacht and park it down in the, the ocean. Park it in one of the, the docks somewhere along the ocean. And after a few years, if you just leave that dock sit there, uh, that, that boat sit there in the dock, after a while, what's going to happen? It's going to start to erode. Why? Because the salt water, the very thing that it floats on, begins to erode the material that makes up the bow of the boat. After a while, you're going to see barnacles all over it, chewing it up, eating it up, ruining the paint job, ruining the finish, ruining not only the finish, but also it, it can destroy the, the actual uh, consistency of the wood or the material that's making the boat, which is why uh, they have to go and scrape all this off and, you know, because it's destructive. Buy a brand new car. 
Of course, nowadays they're better about it than they used to be. Back in my day, we used to have to get underproofing and rust proofing, and yeah, Zbart was the big company back then. You used to have to make sure your car was rust proofed and undercoated. Why? Because you wouldn't own that car four or five years, and you'd have holes under the fenders, and you'd have holes in your bumpers, because the salt that they use on the winter streets would eat right through the metal of your vehicle. My friend, everything around us is destructive in nature. Everything around us is there to destroy. That's the nature of the beast. That's the nature of our fallen human existence. Understanding that, now understand why it's so important, mom, dad, partner, husband, wife, understand why the most important role you can play in your partner's life is to build them up. Hmm, gee, Brother Mara, I think I kind of, sort of, kind of get it now. I think I kind of, sort of, kind of understand it a little bit better now. Because, you know, it's true. When you go to work, I can do a million nice things at work. I can do a million good things. And I might get a little pat on the back once in a while. But, boy, let me mess up one time and they'll come down on me like hell's bells. Am I right? But isn't it wonderful when you've got somebody in your life that's in your corner who believes in you? And when everybody, you know, bless God, if there's a person in my life that, that fits this bill to the T, I always think of my great-grandmother, Picanso. You could be so wrong, it wasn't even right. But she was behind you. <laughs> that woman... That was that was the the endless boundless measure of her love. She supported you. If you were hers, if you belonged to her family, if you were part of her group, her family, then sweetheart, she was behind you. She believed in you. She trusted you. She had confidence in you. She supported you. Period. Case closed. End of the story. That's all there was. And, and I tell the truth. My grandmother Bell, bless God, I love my grandmother Bell. But Grandma Bell, oh Lord, I've told her so many times. I said, Grandma, you are the most pessimistic person I've ever known in my life. Oh, I'm not pessimistic. I'm just realistic. I said, no, you're not realistic. And I've preached messages on this. I said, realistic by whose standard? By God's or the world's? I said, because by, by God's standard... It was a realistic thing to do to roll the stone away when Lazarus had been dead four days, but by the world standards, they said, hey man, he stinks already. So whose standard are you judging by? When you tell me you're just being realistic, whose standard are you using? The world's or God's? When you speak your unbelief and when you speak your negativity and you speak your discouragement and you speak all these things, whose standard are you using? Speak up. You can't hear you. I'm going to tell you today, God wants his people to speak up, not so that the world can hear them, but so that they can hear themselves over the world. Amen. So that whatever daddy's yelling at you when he's abusing you, whatever mommy's yelling at you when she doesn't believe in you, whatever the kids on the bus are calling you, whatever the kids in the school are screaming at you, whatever names you're being called, however your boss is berating you, however your neighbor is battling with you, the reality is God wants you to speak up so that you can hear yourself. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible tells us today in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21, listen to this now, you've heard me talk about it before, a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. You want to feel good? Talk good. You want to feel positive? Talk positive. You want to feel faith? Talk faith. Because what comes out of your mouth is going to come right back into you. Jesus said it's not what goes into a man that defiles a man, but what comes out of him. If you talk trash and crap and garbage and junk, then baby, guess what? You're just going to fill yourself up with trash and junk and garbage and negativity and destruction and all those things. 
because a man's belly will be satisfied by his mouth. What you say is going to create the existence that you have to live in. You ever met people who you think to yourself, Lord, they just have the worst existence. They're, you know, poor, bless them. They're, they just don't have much. And, they, you know, they don't have a swimming pool in their apartment complex. My God, how do they survive? And they don't have a sauna. And, Lord, they, they've got eight grandchildren living with them. And they're in a two-bedroom apartment instead of a five-bedroom house. And what a miserable existence. And yet to talk to them, you'd think they were Queen Elizabeth living up there in London somewhere. You ever met people like that? I'll tell you one person, again, who comes to mind when I think about that kind of a positive uh, attitude and that kind of a positive profession is my Aunt Geneva. Aunt Geneva didn't have a whole lot. Aunt Geneva, bless her heart, she had a husband who had a very bad, uh, serious health issue with epilepsy. The man could barely ever work. He'd have a job from here and again. He'd take a job for a little while. Then he'd have a seizure and he'd lose that job. They never could own much. They never could have much. But boy, let me tell you, you talk to Mount Geneva and honey, I guarantee you by the time you're done with your conversation, you're going to think that she owns half the city. Not because she's going to tell you a bunch of puffed up fibs. Not because she's going to stand there and lie to you. Not because she's going to say things that aren't so. No, but because she was satisfied where she was at. She was happy with what she had. She saw God's blessing. She saw God's favor in her life. And it didn't matter whether God gave her uh, possessions and houses and uh, cars and all of this, but what God did give her, she was thrilled with. And that little lady had such a wonderful, positive spirit, and you could not talk to that woman and get a negative word hardly to come out of her mouth. She thought every preacher on TV was just wonderful. That used to drive me crazy. <laughs> Bless her heart. Honestly, in all sincerity, she really didn't have much in the way of discernment. She she really was not very discerning. But it, Grandma Bill and I sometimes would talk, and Aunt Geneva called, and she's getting into this laughing movement where everybody running around laughing, and oh, you know, and and she didn't have a whole lot in the way of discernment, but that was just her outlook. It had to do with the way Aunt Geneva looked at everything. She'd rather look at it positively than negatively. She'd rather look at it through kind eyes than harsh eyes. She'd rather look at it non-judgmentally than judgmentally. Oh, God, how we could use to have some folks in our church world today like that. But listen to what else the Word of the Lord tells us in Proverbs 18 and verse 21. Not only... I started... Uh, at verse 20, actually, by accident, but it's good because there were some important things in there. And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it, meaning that love life, shall eat the fruit thereof. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. People wonder why they're, they're walking around in this horrible, horrendous, hideous existence and they're constantly feeling down and depressed and negative. Oh, it's because, number one, that's all they ever talk. And number two, because most of the people they surround themselves with, that's all they ever talk either. Amen. I'm going to tell you right now, I, don't, I do not waste my time with negative naysayers and negative people. If I get around somebody who has that kind of a spirit and that kind of an attitude, baby, I distance myself as quick as I can. I don't have time to fill my ears with all that negative crap. All the, uh, there's already enough negativity. There's already enough destructiveness out there. I don't need to purposely uh, make my ears available to someone who's going to feed them with even more. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The tongue is a mighty, important instrument today. In Psalm chapter 57 and verse 4, the word of the Lord tells us, Psalms chapter 57 and verse 4, 
My soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. So you see David saying, Folks, people out there in the world, their mouths are instruments of destruction. You want to get torn down, all you have to do is, is walk around for a few minutes, and I guarantee you within 10 minutes you'll hear enough negativity and nastiness that you'll automatically begin to feel bad. Automatically begin to feel down. Automatically. Just let somebody cuss you because they're driving like a lunatic and they cut you off, but then they have the audacity to turn around and mouth off at you, and you don't even hear what they're saying. But isn't it funny, you don't hear what they're saying, but you're feeling it? Oh, yeah, I could, you know, I could cut somebody off in traffic and be all mad at them, or they can be all mad at me when I'll turn my head and go, and I can just see him in the office. Did you hear him tell me to? Why did you see that guy tell me to? I know he just told me to. <clears throat> see, all you see is the lips moving. You don't know what the other person is saying. But you see, the tongue and the mouth is a weapon of war in the world. But in God's church, the mouth ought to be something more constructive than merely a weapon of war. In James chapter 3 and verse 6, the word of the Lord tells us the tongue is a world of iniquity. He says it's a whole universe unto itself of nothing but trouble. Amen. And isn't that the truth? But you see, this is why the key to maintaining our salvation today is found in Romans 10 and 9. Notice I said the key to maintaining, not to attaining. If we confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If we confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, what's Paul saying to the Romans? He's saying, ever once in a while, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Speak up. You can't hear you. Ever once in a while, you've got to remind yourself that you're the purchased possession of God Almighty. Once in a while, you've got to remind yourself that you belong to the Lord. You're His, and He's yours, and the devil can't change that. I don't care how bad a day you've had. I don't care how much you've outcussed your neighbor. I don't care how much you've out yelled the guy down the street. I don't care how much of an angry, lousy, horrible day you may have had. Children, you change day to day. You're human. But thanks be unto God, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You were his purchased possession before you got mad, and you're his purchased possession after you get mad. Hallelujah. And you need to remind yourself of that once in a while. Sometimes we wouldn't act like a fool so much if we'd speak up so we could hear ourselves and say, Charles, you're the redeemed of the Lord. Hallelujah. If I'd say that, maybe I wouldn't act the way I do. My Lord, have mercy. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, Jesus said, if we confess him before men, that he would confess us before the angels. Confess, that means you've got to open your mouth. It's all well and good to say, well, I believe Christianity is a private matter. What I believe is what I believe. It's not anybody else's business. I don't bother them with mine if they don't bother me with theirs. Uh, Charles, I don't know why every time you go in somewhere and somebody mentions a loved one that's sick or somebody in a hospital dying or very seriously ill or injured and you've got to start telling them your testimony and your story about how God brought you out when you should have been dead and how the Lord brought you up when the doctors weren't even doing what they should have been doing and weren't looking in the right direction and God was watching my back and made sure that this body did not expire and did not pass from this life even when all the people who could have done something to help were doing all the wrong things. God 
still was looking out for me. And I don't know why you got to tell everybody that. Don't know why I got every time I turn around, you tell them that story again. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the angels. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. No, I didn't say, you know, if you believe with your head the Lord Jesus, that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. I'm not ashamed to tell people I serve the Lord. I'm not ashamed to tell people I love the Lord. I'm not ashamed to tell people I believe in the Lord. Now, there's a lot of people talk that talk, but they don't believe in their heart. So it's easy to talk the talk without walking the walk. It can't be either or, friend. It's not a multiple choice. It's both. You've got to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. The word of the Lord today, I say this is a simple word of exhortation. I'm almost done. The word of the Lord tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 15, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. you got to put it into words. Speak up. You can't hear you. You can't live this life and not talk about it. You can't live this life and not say something about it. You can't live this life and not share it with somebody. It just doesn't work that way. Christianity is a given religion. Say, well, but I ain't got nothing to give. Sure you do. Sure you do. You've always... Peter and John came away. They, here they were entering the temple, and the man was looking for something. Peter and John, obviously the prosperity preachers hadn't gotten to them yet because they didn't have any money. But Peter turns around and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. You know, I tell people when I hear them talking about dire circumstances and difficult times, I say, I believe in prayer. I believe God's a miracle-working God. I believe there's power in Jesus' name. I don't care whether you believe it or you don't believe it. I believe it. And if you uh, will let me, I'll, I'll pray for that person. I'll have our church pray for that person. I'll have my pastor come visit that person. You've got something to offer. You've got a pastor. If you hadn't learned this now in the, the time you've known me, I'll go wherever I'm asked to go. I don't have to know the person in the hospital. I don't have to know that person. I don't have to know anything about them. If somebody in my church says to me, would you go visit so-and-so, I'll go. Amen. I've been asked in recent months, I've been asked to visit one church member's cousin. I've been asked to visit another church member's co-worker's dad. And then there was a third one there that, for the life of me, I can't remember who that... That's right. And then, then I had another church member who had a co-worker, and her husband was in the hospital. These people don't have anything to do with our church. They're not connected to our church. They don't have to be. That's what it's, it's called, being a witness. It's called being a testimony for Jesus. It's called showing the love of God and the compassion of the Lord. It's shown illustrating the grace of God to people when they're in a time of need and desperation. That's what it's all about. That's what ministry is all about. So I don't have anything to offer. Sure you do. Would you like my pastor to come visit you? Would you like my... Uh, you know, a husband and a wife are struggling with a relationship, and they're having a very difficult time. And you can say, you know what? My pastor would be more than happy to talk with you all. He'd be happy to come to your home and counsel with you. Would you like him to come counsel with you? You've got something to offer. Let me tell you, there's a lot of churches today, the preachers don't bother themselves with these kind of things anymore. It's kind of like doctors making house calls, you know. That's a thing of the past. But I'm going to tell you, this preacher has been a hands-on preacher as long as I've been in ministry. That's how churches grow. You stop being an, an, an observer and watching the world go by, and if you start getting involved a little bit and let the redeemed of the Lord say so, speak up. You can't hear you. And if you can't hear you, nobody else can hear you either. 
so well and good to hear a situation going on beside us and we say, well, bless God, you know, I'll have to mention that in church so we can pray for that person. Well, that was a lovely thought. Guess what? That person next to you is not Jean Dixon. She couldn't read your thoughts. That person next to you don't work for Psychic Friends Network. She can't read your thought. Yes, it's a lovely thought, but they can't read your thought. But if you'll speak up and be a testimony for Jesus and say, you know what, I believe in God, and I believe God answers prayer, and my church would be more than happy to take your, your need up and hold it up before the Lord and pray for you and help you pray about that. My pastor would be more than happy to come to your home and visit with you. My pastor would be more than happy to come and help you. And you'll be surprised what a difference all of a sudden. Before too long, people start to say, you know what, that preacher came and visited me in my hour of, tr of tr struggle and difficult time. I believe I want to go visit his church. I remember one time in my first church, I'm almost done tonight, I remember in my first church years ago, Sue and Leo were a couple that were with me from our very first Sunday. And Sue came to me and said, Brother Marl, I know a lady, she's the Assemblies of God, she goes to an Assembly of God church in Shelton, and uh, she's uh, twice married, twice divorced, has two kids, one from each husband. She said... Uh, she tries to live off of the alimony and child support and what have you. She doesn't work for whatever reason. I'm, I won't get into that, <laughs> whether I agreed with that or didn't. She said, but she's a very devout girl. She's full of the Holy Ghost. She loves the Lord. She said, but her son, her husband, her ex-husband, the father of the oldest boy, the son, is a Buddhist, and he's constantly putting all kinds of thoughts into that child's mind causing problems for her. Every time he comes home from his dad's house, poor June just goes through all kinds of grief, and for about a week, he's just a wreck. So said, well, I happen to know that June is really struggling. She has no groceries. And I said, okay. What's the address? She gave me the address. Try me one day and see if I don't do this. Just try me. I went into my pantry in my apartment, and anybody who knows me knows that if I don't have clothes, I have food. I have lived many years in my life, and I've struggled, and I've been through times when I didn't have anything to eat, and if there's anything I hate is to be hungry. So I like to keep food in my pantry. I went into my pantry, and I cleaned out about three big shopping bags full of canned goods and dry goods and everything and I put them in my little Chevy Vega station wagon and before I drove down to her house I wouldn't give to anybody what I wouldn't want to receive and I had about $20 in my pocket I think at the time and I said Lord I'm going to go to the grocery store and I'm going to buy that lady $20 worth of meat so that not only will she have pasta not only will she have rice not only will she have tomato sauce not only will she have uh, all of these things, but she also can have some hot dogs, and she can have some hamburger, she can have some chicken, you know, uh, 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 some, uh, uh, one of the other things I like to get a lot, because you can stretch it, if you know what you're doing, is beef cubes, you know, like you can make stew, or you can make uh, over rice, or something, you know, so anyway, so I, I, I bought her $20 worth of meat, and whenever I do something like this, I always, as I'm doing it, I'll say, this I do in Jesus' name. I'm doing this as if I'm Jesus, because I know this is what Jesus would do if he were in my exact spot. And I drove to that lady's house, had never met her, didn't know her from Jack the Ripper. Knocked on her door, and I said, June, hi, I'm Pastor Morrow from Holiness Tabernacle, Church of God over here in Seymour, and I understand that you need some stuff. And she said, oh, Brother Mar, you have no idea. I said, yes, I do. I said, well, let's quit talking about the problem. I said, we've got the answer. And I just carried in them groceries, and she cried. She said, my own church never helps me. I've been going there for 10 years, and they never helped me. Nobody has ever brought me groceries before like this. See, our church back then was awful strict and hard, you know, by... A lot of people's standards, you know, we were awful strict.
June was kind of afraid of us, and she told me so. I said, Brother Mom, you know, y'all are so strict. You know, your ladies don't cut their hair and all that. I said, Jerry, if you want to come to church, honey, just come to church. I said, those issues, let them take care of themselves. I said, nobody's going to stand over you and demand that you, that you stop cutting your hair. Nobody's going to stand over you and tell you you can't wear your eye makeup or you can't wear jewelry. I said, you just come to church and let God, if the Lord deals with you about it, well then, do what you got to do. Until then, you just come, learn, grow, and serve the Lord. About a week or two later, here comes June and her two children into my church. Became some of the most faithful people. That son of hers got so on fire for God. Him and my little cousin Owen used to love to go out into the highways and byways and pass out tracks. Invite people to church. Kids, 12 years old. On fire for God. Love the church. I want to tell everybody in the world about it. They, they loved it so much. And June was having trouble with her son. And I said, June, I don't have a lot of money. There's a lot of help I maybe can't give you sometimes, but I'll tell you what I can do. When your son, when does he come home from his bed? And she told me. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. Let's make a weekly ritual when he's home with you. Every, I think it was Wednesday, every Wednesday, he's going to go with me, and I'm going to do all my errands for the day. I said, I'm not going to promise him Disneyland and anything spectacular. I said, but when I go, if I go to the bank, he'll go to the bank with me. If I go to the nursing home, he'll go to the nursing home with me. If I go visit somebody in the hospital, he'll go to the hospital with me. I said, but it might just do him well to have a man in his life that's a Christian, that's a believer. You know, sometimes children, we have something to offer when we don't think we have a thing. We do have something. And I offered her my time and my effort and my energy. And that boy would come and he'd spend the day with me. And she, about two or three weeks after I started doing that, she said, Brother Mar, I've got a different son. I said, Jason isn't even the same boy. I said, that kid loves you so much. He's so thrilled every week you come to get him. He feels so special. He feels like the pastor thinks that he's worth something to invest some time. She said, he's doing better in school. He's not getting into trouble. She said, it, it, that his whole life has changed. Why, Tommy? Because when that little beggar was looking my way, looking for alms, instead of me walking by thinking, mm, I don't have nothing. I thought for a minute and said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I've got something may not be what they're looking for, may not be what they're asking for, but you know what? What I have may be more valuable. What I have may be more uh, important. What I have may actually be, be more life-changing than what they're asking for. And you offer what you got. So you open your mouth, but it can't happen if you don't open your mouth. And lastly tonight, you've heard me say it, Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, the Word of God tells us we become, we are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Brother Mar, why do you talk about victories God's given you over and over? Why do you talk about past experiences over and over? I'll tell you why. For the same reason that God told the children of Israel to repeat these things in the hearing of their children. The Lord said, repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. Why? I'll tell you why. Because the minute you stop repeating it, they'll forget it. Did you hear me now? The minute I stop talking about what God did for me five and a half years ago in that hospital, Mother, the minute I start stop talking about it, guess what? Tommy could have heard me tell that story a thousand times, and he'll forget all about it. And then all of a sudden one day, ten years from now, I might not have mentioned it for ten solid years. All of a sudden I'll mention it after ten years, and he'll say, Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Tell me you haven't done that. Oh, yes, I forgot my uncle had that car wreck that nearly killed him. I forgot he was practically paralyzed and in the hospital on life support. It's not like you forgot some little thing. That's human nature. That's why the Word of God tells us, speak up. You can't hear you. 
talk about it, let it come out of your mouth, speak it, profess it, confess it. Because if we don't, we're going to lose it. You don't talk about it, you're going to forget about it. God told the children of Israel, he said, talk about these things.